told me Australians were accused of mumbling in order to keep flies from entering their mouth. There were ants and ant-like insects, which were actually termites that build huge tune-shaped mounds. Plus there were scorpions that liked to hide in shoes. Give your boots a shake in the morning, Grant said. I was not cheerful. When we stopped for the day, Cameron knelt down and ran his hand over the ground. Rain and wind had changed the track in the years since he'd been here. Gutted and pierced with no discernible pattern, it would be easy to follow in any number of directions, any number wrong. It all looks the same, I said. Not to me, he said, indicating the way with a lift of his chin. He was confident and unlike the rest of us, he seemed more content the further out we went. I wondered how I could be the child of such a man. When I first moved to New York, it took me days to figure out Fifth Avenue divided east from west. I remember, too, driving out of London with Stephen, me acting as navigator, totally lost, caught in the roundabouts, laughing as the map billowed, filling the car, until Stephen grew impatient, then mad, snapping at me. We kept moving now, though we weren't far from a place called Derba Springs, which had a promising sound to it, we wouldn't be making the detour. We had to cross two major deserts, the Gibson and the Great Sandy, as though one weren't enough. More than 150,000 square kilometers combined. Isolation and emptiness took over as comfort faded to memory. I thought about Ida and the tidiness of the house where I grew up. The two sets of kitchen curtains changed every other week, pressed crisp. The coolness of the stark living room, brown and pale yellow, where we rarely set foot. I wonder what she had been like when she was here, daring, carefree. And if that were true, what had changed her into the woman of that pristine household where it seemed insincerity flowed from the taps? Fifth night, it felt like forever. How far had we gone, how far to go? Except for the campfire, absolute darkness. And yet I'd still strain to see into nothing. Cameron stood across from where I sat, warming my hands by the fire, just the two of us. I want to know about my mother, I said, when she was here. He took a step back. She had a wonderful laugh. I inhaled cold air, shivering. Did she, I thought. I couldn't remember the last time I'd heard her laugh. She was married, had a family, I said. I never thought to hurt anyone. No one ever does, I said. We were young, he said. I wasn't buying it, young and foolish. And then she was gone, he said. It was so quiet you could hear a spider crawl. Cameron kept his eyes on the ground and I could almost feel the hard bones of his hands as he placed one over the other on his lap, a nearly inaudible sigh from his lips. I was angry and frustrated with his reticence, but anger wouldn't get me anywhere and I wanted him to keep talking. The fire snapped with falling shards and in the faint light, I could just make out Grant's face as he approached. It smells like rain, he said, coming closer. He looked at the sky and I looked at him, happy to see him, yet wishing he hadn't intruded. A quick storm, Cameron said, unseasonable this time of year. It had never occurred to me that it would rain in the desert, but the wind picked up and there was a scampering of something unseen as clouds covered the stars and a light rain quickly turned heavy. We made a run for it, Grant holding my arm. I was overly conscious of his touch as I rushed to the tent I shared with Jen. Cameron sauntered by as though he was waterproof, looking up at us from under his dripping hat. Now the storm came in loud waves and I climbed on my bedroll and opened the window flap to watch lightning flash. Each shock intensified with glorious white light against perfect black and rained so hard I thought it might pierce the canvas. I'd never heard or seen anything like it. In the city, rainstorms always meant unavailable taxis and slate gray clouds obscuring the high rise summit. Here it was extravagant frighteningly beautiful and calming, as if for the first time I had a true sense of the force of nature and being a part of it, I was unafraid. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. 
Our next author is Martha Engber. Martha is the author of Winter Light, The Wind Thief, and growing great characters from the ground up. A Chicago native, she lives in Northern California with her husband, bike, and surfboard. Thank you, Linda, and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm going to read uh, a introduction so you'll understand where the story picks up. The book opens when events in Mary's life force her to do what many of us don't, reach across socioeconomic lines for help. In this case, by forming a friendship with middle-class Kathleen. Though the two girls are physically near one another at school and live in the same town, they move within social groups and belong to families so different from one another that Mary and Kathleen struggle to learn one another's language. In this scene, school has been let out early due to a heavy snowstorm on its way. Mary spies Kathleen up ahead walking home. They've already had a few run-ins, but the good from the interactions now outweighs the bad. Mary seizes the opportunity to smooth over the last dust up. Mary neared and stopped. So she said, trying to catch her breath and sound uninterested at the same time, a tough gig. Now she suddenly didn't know what to say, maybe because she had no experience pursuing anyone. Why'd you ignore me this morning? I didn't ignore you, Kathleen said. Hell, you didn't. You walked right by me without saying anything. Well, it wasn't like you said hi to me either, and you didn't answer my calls, which is really impolite. I know. You know, so why'd you do it? Mary shrugged. That's all, Kathleen said, and gave an exaggerated shrug to mimic Mary. Don't you ever have homework? What? I never see you carrying anything. Mary kept her eyes on Kathleen, on the point. You afraid to be seen with me? No, Kathleen said, yet she dropped her eyes. No as in yes. How come? Kathleen looked up. I'm not. Don't bullshit me, Kat. Stop calling me that. Mary leaned forward. So, Kat, are you afraid to be seen talking to me? Kathleen threw out a mittened hand. Oh, so now all of a sudden we're being honest. Yeah. Oh, well, so long as we're being honest. So are you? Yeah, Kathleen said, her cheeks a blotched red and white. Why? Because you're a burnout. She stared at Kathleen. The snow between them like white noise made of silence. They both knew the hierarchy. Preps, jocks, geeks, burnouts. A social strata similar to the geological one Mr. Van Dyke talked about last year in Earth Science how one layer presses down on the previous one with new layers added all the time with neither pause nor mercy. Eventually the weight grew unbearable and squashed varying sediments together into inescapable rivers of grit. Mary and her crowd comprised the very bottom layer, the shittiest place to be stuck, the weight so heavy you can't escape. So by associating with a burnout you are one, Mary said, Oh, right, and like you haven't gone out of your way to keep from introducing me to your friends because I'm too uncool. You met them already. Uh-uh, I did not meet them. You did not introduce me. You just let them give me trouble. The jaw and cheek muscles of Kathleen's face jumped. You wouldn't really introduce me like as a friend because you'd be afraid of what they'd say about you hanging out with someone you think is such a Girl Scout. Were you? That's not the point, she huffed, creating white clouds of breath. You'd be embarrassed because I don't smoke and I don't do drugs and I don't date hot guys and flunk my classes. Mary smiled a little. And why is it you don't? And why is it you do, Kathleen shouted before casting her blazing eyes to the ground. A boy walked their way, books under his arm. He had his head down in a way that said he'd heard the yelling and would pretend he hadn't so long as they just let him pass without hassling him. Yet he was nobody Mary knew, so she didn't move. He started to climb onto the hill of snow piled beside the sidewalk, his boots slipping and hand, uh, and hand out for balance. Then Kathleen, ever so fucking polite, stepped out of his way so, she, so he could get back on the sidewalk. He glanced at her and smiled. She smiled, like everything was okay when it wasn't. The fake. And sure enough, when Kathleen turned to Mary, the smile disappeared. 
It's like you want to fail, Kathleen said, and live a deplorable life of misery when all you'd have to do is homework sometimes and stuff. She leaned closer to Kathleen. You have no goddamn idea what you're talking about. Well, maybe I don't, but at least I try. None of you try. Oh, so now I represent all the burnouts? Well, you do. You're like the queen of them or something. How the hell would you know? At least I call people back. Tough girl, Kathleen, with a thousand emotions fighting for space on that tiny oval stage. A kid in white mittens who said things like a deplorable life of misery with a straight face. Something about her that could piss you off and at the same time make you face yourself. Mary smiled. It's not funny, Kathleen said. If not, then why are you laughing at? Mary didn't want to laugh, but did anyway. I'm not laughing at you. You are. It's just that you're right. Kathleen pressed her lips tight, apparently having expected Mary's reasoning to go left, only to have it go right. I'm sorry, Mary said, still smiling, but feeling more sincere than she had in a long time. I should have called. I was just, just what? What could she tell Kathleen that she didn't understand or would, uh, wouldn't scare her about Darby's treachery and not getting the job, about Mary's envy at all Kathleen had, about the horror of wearing someone else's blood? Mary knocked her head sideways. Just messed up. It's really nice of you to check in on me and to invite me to your party. I bet yours was more fun than the one I went to. Kathleen's eyes held the heat of a battle she'd won but wished she hadn't had to fight. She must not know what to think. Mary didn't either. Thank you so much for coming tonight and listening. Thank you, Martha. <laughs> Our next author is Melanie Faith. Melanie is a Gen Xer who wears many professional hats, including poet, prose writer, photographer, editor, and professor. She enjoys the clack of old school typewriter keys and creating how-to craft books about diverse writing topics. And before you start, Melanie, I wanna um, invite everyone to speak in the loudest voice possible. I don't want to miss a word. Thanks so much, everyone, and thank you very much, Linda. I'll be reading from my book in a flash, which has a lot of tips and exercises and anecdotes for writers of flash fiction as well as flash nonfiction. This first chapter is for the flash fiction writers, and it's called Retrotastic Smalls. I've always been an old soul and fascinated with small vintage items, items from a time when things were made sturdy because most people couldn't afford to replace them and had to appreciate and also repair them themselves, the few things that they had. These vintage finds are collectible from postcards and fountain pens to retro advertising and magazines to brooches, gloves, buttons, and from vanity sets to skeleton keys. They're authentic with dings and wear and appeal to me as objects rich with story, both real and imagined. In the antique world, these are often called smalls as they don't fetch a huge price, but collectively and in good shape, these treasures are immensely sellable, both online and at flea market stalls. People seek them for nostalgic reasons. Hey, I had that as a kid. Or for the amusement of collecting something authentic that takes up little space for an entry level price. We'd all like a genuine Tiffany, but most buyers realize the lamp is way out of our league. A costume jewelry pin we can affix to a coat or a bag for a mere $15 though? Yes, please. One of my uncles and I used to watch several collectible shows whenever I'd visit. We enjoyed guessing the prices of treasures and had fun conversations when the conditions and selling prices were revealed. In another life, I might have studied to become an appraiser or an auctioneer or had my own antique store with a pretty awning and my last name and fetching curly Q script. The bits and bobs found in people's attics and basements, the collected ephemera of relatives and friends has always drawn me. While I'll never say never, and I continue to browse great finds online and remain a devotee of the antique shows, at this point in my writing, publishing, and teaching careers, I realize that I already have plenty of ambitions and obligations on my plate. One of the great things about writing fiction is that we can explore these side hobbies and oddball what ifs. No, I won't risk my bankroll on a wide variety of inventory, but who's to say I can't create a character who does? Scratch under the surface just a little, and most people have a topic or unexplored career that interests them. You probably have more than one, I know I do. Even if you don't know everything there is to know about your topic, 
you definitely know more than you think you do and can easily fill in what you don't know with a few online searches. You certainly know enough to create a flash where your main character is part of the career, hobby, or world that has always interested you. A few questions to explore as your fictional character partakes in your interests. What vocabulary is specific to this career or hobby? Include a few of these terms as I did above with vintage and smalls. What kind of culture has arisen surrounding this vocation? Who is in the know? Who has no idea? How will the knowledgeable interact with the no clues? Did your protagonist take a beeline to this vocation or were there pit stops and obstacles along the way? How did they learn so much about this subset of society? Does your protagonist show off his or her knowledge in a flashy way or feel a bit shy at times about this knowledge? Try this prompt. Pick two of the guiding questions above and work the answers into your draft. Your protagonist knows the answers and so should the reader by the end of the draft. My chapter for the nonfiction writers is called It's Not Over. One of my favorite online photographers, Jennifer Thorson, incorporates volcanic ash into some of her conceptual portraits. The idea of working with ash originated when she took a pottery making class and discovered that potters sometimes add ash to make the walls of their vessels stronger. Consider it. There are people whose job is to scramble, climb, and collect the detritus post-cooling to package and sell to artists. There's something intriguing about working with what is discarded, left behind, forgotten, or thrown away. Burnt particles becoming embers again in a new materialization, making something just as vigorous and resilient in the repurposing. Like ash, there are layers to memories. Who we were, who we hope to be one day but never became, who we are, and who we hope yet to be, all intermingling. Where have you experienced endings that can become touchstones to beginnings in your prose? I might be, it might be a life stage, an era, relationships, jobs, or something else entirely. I will never again be an undergrad. I will never have my first airplane ride or roller skate on wobbly knees across a paved rural road without helmet or knee pads. Yet I carry these experiences within me, material to be unearthed and repurposed at will just as that ash is gathered, collected, sold, and repurposed. How does it feel to know this? You have passed multitudes of milestones and yet never entirely forgotten some aspect of experiences, even if they're paved over with many, many months and other events since. That's something worth writing about. Try this prompt. What do you recall of being a newbie? Integrate as many of the senses and images as possible to flesh out the landscape both internal and external. From this vantage point, how have these experiences made you stronger, made you more yourself? How did they hint at who you are now? What would you never bother explaining about the experience to your younger self? Thank you so much for coming to our reading. We really appreciate you. Thank you so much, Melanie. Our next author is Jane Martin. Jane is a push cart Best Small Fictions and Best Microfictions nominee and a recipient of Vestal Review's Vera Award. She's the author of a collection of microfiction, Tender Cuts. Hi, everybody. Well, it's good to follow Melanie because I'm talking about microfiction, considered experimental, because the word count or the word limit is usually about 300 words. Um, but I'll be reading a couple that are much shorter. And uh, I liken the writing of microfiction to the art of bonsai in that you're creating a very tiny tree, but it's complete in itself. So the first story is the title story from the collection and it's called Tender Cuts. Julie Sue's hair cascades in golden ringlets past her tiny shoulders falling near her tightly corseted waist. The corset pinches her skin, but Mama says to keep smiling, so she does. The Little Miss Soybean pageant pays $150 to the winner, and Mama says they need the money. Next to the stage, the stench of livestock rises from a pen where the 4-H animals await their turn at auction. Flies swarm in the summer heat, and Julie Sue bats them away from her face. Stop your fussing, 
Mama scolds. She will dance the can-can just like she's been taught. She wanted to twirl a baton like Becky or sing a song like Bonnie Jean. She doesn't like raising her skirt up and showing her panties. But Mama says she has nice legs and she should use what the good Lord gave her. The auctioneer's voice rises and cheers explode from the nearby tent. Someone's prize heifer sells for $1,000. Her music starts and Mama pushes her onto the stage. She will kick as high as she can. The next piece is called The New Kid and it's 46 words. The New Kid. Smaller than the other fifth graders, a stutter to his speech, his clothes obvious hand-me-downs, he would arrive home from school each day, bruised and bitter. Today, they'd strewn his bagged lunch across the playground. He had only intended to show them the gun. I'll lighten it up a bit on this next piece. It's called I married a 1985 Buick LaSabra. He was solid, dependable, and had a spine of steel. Never a small woman, I felt dainty when I sunk into his embrace, his ride snug and gentle. He'd been married once before, and there were scrapes and a few dents to show for it, but under the hood, his engine still hummed, and I believed my heart could heal his. You're the reason, you're my reason for living, he'd say. And for a long time, that's how it was. We weathered the rough roads and gave thanks for our blessings over the smooth ones, him never once failing to get us safely home. I suppose there were signs when it all began to change, things I didn't or chose not to notice. Always a morning person, he became slow to get started. The cough, he said, was nothing until his whole body shuddered. The purr that became an angry growl of frustration. We were told that connectors in his brain weren't sparking like they used to, and some other parts needed work too. But my husband was a stubborn man. One day I awoke and he was simply gone. There was instead someone I didn't recognize, small and mean, roaring around the streets until all hours in flashy colors of someone half his age. I tried to fit in with these new expectations, but there was simply no room for me. When I began finding parking tickets from neighborhoods a good distance from our own, he didn't even try to make up a story. Police said they found him wrapped around a utility pole, a long black Cadillac now awaits me at the curb. This one is called Last Date. The second hand ticks off another moment of my life. Waiting couples eye my table. I pretend to sip from the empty cup, lick the last bit of foam. You arrive from her bed, flushed, rushed, and unapologetic, wearing the sea green cashmere v-neck I gave you for Christmas. My finger tightens around the cold smooth steel nestled in my lap. A real shame about that sweater. Nobody wants my table now. And finally, I'm gonna end on a piece called Eventide. Your face is the first to fade from memory. Still your voice, a bow caressing the strings of a cello, holds me close. Your scent, evergreens dipping to the seashore, calms me on days when I cannot locate your name. I am running in the woods that stretch across the hilltop behind our homes, skinny legs and brand new kids, my ponytail sailing behind, leaves crunch beneath my feet, as woodland birds take flight in our path. Fingers of sunlight reach through branches heavy with pine cones that will one day decorate a mantle 
hung with stockings, bearing chocolate, nuts, and oranges. Children's names we will choose together, names that now reside only with you. I laugh and run ahead fast enough for you to give chase, but slow enough that you will always catch me. And you always have caught me, taken my hand in yours, and guided me home. But now I drift to where you cannot follow, where I am lost to even myself, and the sun must bow to the rising moon. A nightingale sings at my window, at my bedside, the photo of a young couple in wedding attire, beautiful strangers. I had a beau who looked just like you once. Dance with me, you say. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Jay. What a stunning array of authors we have here tonight. We're about halfway through. We've heard four of eight readings. I want to remind you that if you have a burning question that comes up for one of our authors, type it in the chat. We have a little bit of time at the end that I can um, hopefully ask that question to the authors. Our next author is Joanne Nelson. Joanne's writing appears in numerous anthologies and literary journals, and she's a contributor to Lake Effect, her local NPR affiliate. She lives, writes, and teaches in Heartland, Wisconsin. Thank you, Linda. My reading this evening is from my memoir, This Is How We Leave. Here's a picture. It is part of the chapter, Love Lost. Timmy and I were high school seniors when we dated. He went to St. Thomas More, the Catholic boys' school, just a few miles from St. Mary's Academy, the girls' school I attended. There was plenty of mingling. We went to homecoming at his school, of course. His cousin drove as Timmy didn't have his license yet. I remember sitting on Timmy's lap in the brightly lit social hall gray and blue bunting floating from the ceiling, glasses of soda scattered on the tables, friends surrounding us. When I lean away from Timmy to whisper with a friend, I can feel his arms tight around my waist. Timmy, as best I recall, was a true love, but he certainly wasn't the first boy I ever kissed. My first kiss, a French kiss, happened after a different Thomas More gathering, the first dance of freshman year, 1976. The band had finished for the night. I'd been dancing with a boy I'd only just met. Now he walked me down the hall, past the lockers and tables piled with coats, until we stood on the school steps, anonymous in the dark, boys and girls streaming past us, I turned to say goodbye before running to meet my ride. He bobbed toward me. I realized he wanted more than a friendly hug, that what I dreamt of and read about in Cosmopolitan was about to happen. His face came towards me, his mouth wide open, his teeth clanked against mine, and we kissed, French kissed. I would fantasized about this kiss for years, although usually picturing it, as a more delicate experience. In truth, I found the whole confusion of lips and teeth and tongues disconcerting. I worried about my nose and what to do with my neck, which hurt, as I hadn't arranged the angle correctly and didn't want to interrupt my new friend to rearrange. Anyway, all too soon I had to break our embrace and run down the school steps to catch my ride. I no longer recall the boy's name or even his facial features above his nose, only his open mouth, those straight bright teeth, and that tongue, which may have been somewhat larger and heavier than average, remain. Timmy, from senior year, had messy blonde hair and an overbite. He was tall and the sleeves of his blazers landed right above his wrist bones in a very sweet way. We mostly fooled around in front of his mother's Milwaukee bungalow in my mother's Chevy Impala after I drove him home from our young Christian life meetings. 
I'd glide to the curb, put the car in park, and we'd make out. The porch light above his family's front door was a welcoming beacon that shadowed our faces until it began to flicker on and off, on and off more and more rapidly the longer we tried to ignore it. I imagined Timmy's mom's worries floating through her living room window, past the azaleas asleep in the front yard, and into my car with its undependable heater, tinny AM radio, and sporadically revving engine. Her presence, like Jesus, the unseen guest at every meal, hovered between us as we whispered and kissed. One sad night, when Timmy embraced me, his right hand stayed on the armrest. I could see it there, the arm bent with tension, pulling him away from me and towards the house. And I knew what was coming. I knew even before he said, eyes lowered, that he had to get in early for homework. My drive home that evening through the south side streets was long. I tried to convince myself I'd misjudged the situation, but of course I hadn't. Timmy broke up with me before school the next morning, and our paths didn't cross again. I think about Timmy sometimes, and I'm both disappointed and relieved to find he's apparently not traceable through Facebook or Google. I'm left wondering if, we, if anyone ever looks for me, maybe even that forgotten boy on the steps of Thomas More, the boy left waiting for his parents' car to pull alongside the curb, one more in an endless stream of vehicles, picking up kids from the dance and taking them home again. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Joanne. Our next author is Ian Rogers. Ian lives and works in Toyama, Japan, and is the author of the chapbook, A Kiowa Bombs from Blue Cubicle Press. His first novel, MFA thesis novel, is forthcoming in 2022. Uh, thank you, Linda, for the introduction. And thanks, everybody, for dialing in today. It really means a lot. Uh, so I lived for three years in the state of Nebraska and um, where I did a creative writing master's. And I always tell people that after living in Japan and living in Nebraska, really it was Nebraska that was the bigger culture shock, uh, partly because it was so different from the Northeast US where I'm from, uh, but also because of this very traditional academic setting uh, that I was really kind of isolated in for a long time. And after I got out, I thought, okay, I really want to turn this kind of bizarre world uh, into a comic novel. And that's where the idea for MFA thesis novel came from. And the excerpt I'm going to read for you, uh, Flip, who's the main character, he just got out of his first writing workshop and it didn't go that well. It really did bother him how abominably the workshop had gone. Since up until the professor had started speaking, he'd been so confident that the novel would resonate with others the same way it did with him. The chapters he'd shown to the writers group back home had always gone over well, sparking discussions about oblivious bosses and forced workplace conversations, and the difficulties he and his friends had all had getting out on their own after college. Those conversations, held around secondhand kitchen tables and cheap apartments as preludes to games of Carcassonne or Settlers of Catan, had made him feel like his writing held a real place in the world of grown-up artists who moved people. Those were the times he'd felt most like a creator, that bigger, all-encompassing category to which writers belonged, a person who opened up new worlds for others. His entire reason for drawing or writing or composing off-key songs on his old Casio keyboard had always been to stir meaningful feelings in people the same way so many other pieces of art and writing had in him. And making this happen, he'd realized, was the thing he most believed in. The problem was that stirring meaningful feelings in people had gotten harder as his friends had all gotten busier with their jobs and significant others and the mortgages on their fixer upper houses. And these changes had happened so gradually that they barely felt like changes at all. The others in the old writing group hadn't suddenly chosen to stop writing. They just dropped writing down a few notches on their priority lists, 
until Flip had become the driving force behind their meetings and the only one still bringing new work. It had been this gradual loss of the old Saturday night writing group, even more than escaping that horrible job, that had sparked his quest for a place where writing still held meaning. Flip thought about this as he walked back to his apartment south of downtown where the east-west streets were all named after consecutive letters and the north-south streets were all numbered. The labeling system had initially struck him as ingenious since it allowed him to find his way from 8th Street and 11th to C Street and 23rd without so much as a glance at his phone. But within days, the grid of identically nondescript streets had become disorienting since it seemed that any local flavor the city's neighborhoods might have aspired to had been sacrificed for ease of navigation. Were these the kind of suburbs John Updike had written about? Before making the three-day drive from the Northeast, he'd rented, sight unseen, a second floor apartment in a square brick building that had been unceremoniously slipped into a line of single family houses. The building was three stories high with four apartments on each story surrounding a central staircase. And he imagined each apartment having the same living room, the same bedroom, and the same dull teal colored carpeting as his own. The building's one architectural frivolity was a metal awning stretching over the front steps that evoked a faint image of 1950s urbanity. And beneath it, he'd exchanged a few awkward hellos with his cigarette smoking neighbors in the evenings. But most of the time they just turned and pretended they hadn't seen him. The apartment itself had no real furniture since there hadn't been space in the Honda for anything larger than the wood paneled microwave from his old apartment, the packing trunk he now used instead of a bureau, and the folding card table and chairs he'd set up to double as an eating area and workspace. There'd also been very little time, and even less money, to procure new furniture after arriving, in addition to the difficulty posed by such a task. Back home, if he wanted to scoop up a free Craigslist couch, it would have been easy to borrow someone's pickup, but out here, his options felt decidedly limited. Did furniture stores still deliver, like in old movies? Goodwill and Salvation Army certainly didn't, and any place that did wasn't likely to cater to his price range. If he wanted a real bed, he could probably tie a mattress to the Honda's roof, also like in the movies, and drive it back to the apartment. But mattresses were expensive, and the trip out had cost him more in gas money than he'd expected. He'd done some calculating before his arrival and found that after rent, utilities, groceries, non-deferred student loan payments, and the occasional haircut or clothing purchase, his monthly stipend for working in the University Writing Center still came out $100 short, an unpromising start to this new chapter of his life. Thanks, everybody. And back to you, Linda. Thank you, Ian. Oh, I'm having so much fun. <laughs> Our next author is Carolyn R. Russell. Carolyn is the author of three books, including a dystopian thriller, In the Fullness of Time. Her writing has appeared in the Boston Globe, Flash Fiction Magazine, Dime Show Review, Club Plum Literary Journal, and numerous other publications. She lives on and writes from Boston's North Shore. Thanks so much, Linda. And thanks everybody out there for joining us. Several years ago, I read an article in the New Yorker about a plan to genetically modify mosquitoes so that they couldn't reproduce and release them into the wild in order to combat their bloodborne illnesses. I couldn't stop thinking about the unintended consequences of this kind of thing, and it spawned the backstory for my dystopian YA novel, In the Fullness of Time. Just last month, I read that this controversial project has moved forward and that 750 million genetically modified mosquitoes have been approved to be released in Florida and Texas this year. I'm going to read from the beginning of the book so as not to give away any mysteries. I call my mother. We've been having a tough time together lately, but I know I can always count on her in a crisis especially when she finds out that this one involves a child in need. When she arrives, I'm surprised. She's pulled her clerical hood as closely as she can around her face and used its transparent breathing veil to cover her mouth and nose. She's getting soft, I can't help but think. 
or maybe the stench of the city is getting worse and I haven't noticed. In any case, Meredith Whitman has broken her own record for foot speed. From the stricken look on her face, I can guess why. I missed curfew twice last week. Plus, there's been some other stuff, and I'm not sure how much she knows or what she's been able to guess. She probably assumes I'm in trouble again. Well, hello, young ladies, my mother says. She reaches beneath her tunic to a hand-sewn compartment in the lining. I have a miniature e-taser in mine. It's small, but produces a current strong enough to incapacitate three large men. My mother retrieves a Nutra Bricks bar from hers and hands it to Monica, who tears open the wrapping and shoves the bar into her mouth in one quick motion. I wonder how long it's been since her last meal and I feel terrible that I didn't feed her immediately. What was I thinking? I meet my mother's eyes and no words are needed. Another victim of the state's austerity measures. Slow starvation for those unlucky enough to be low born. But I watch as she takes in the child's braids and clothing and grasps the paradox. This child comes from circumstances that have sh should have put her well beyond most of the cruel realities of life in the States. And yet, she is clearly very hungry and looks like she's been out among the sun bleached multitudes without a bath for a very long time. My mother arches an eyebrow at me and I shake my head. I know as much as she does. She gives me a quick kiss on the cheek and takes me aside. No idea who she is or where she's from? Not yet, but I'll find out. You know, I'm pretty good with a hydro computer. My mother smiles. <laughs> yep, I know, she says. Recently, there had somehow been a little issue with extra water allocations directed to the city's poorest citizens. In a moment of weakness, I amazed my family by being able to explain exactly how the mistake might have been accomplished from a compromised hydro portal. Can you take her home, mom, I ask? Her name is Monica. She's not saying much right now, but maybe later. Can we just take care of her for a bit until we find her people? Of course, honey, she says, walking toward the girl. I was about to suggest that. What do you say, Monica? You wanna come home with me to Somerset's house? Somerset calls me monkey, says the child because I can hold on tight. Monkey it is, says my mother. I hug Monica, now officially monkey and wave. I'll be home a little late tonight, I say. Don't you and dad wait up, I'll make curfew siren. I leave quickly before my mother can muster a response that might ruin our fragile truce. Thanks so much for joining us, everybody. Thank you, Carolyn. Our final author is Gina Troisi. Gina's memoir, The Angle of Flickering Light, is forthcoming in April. Her stories and essays have appeared in Fourth Genre, The Gettysburg Review, Fugue, Under the Sun, and elsewhere. She lives in coastal Maine. Thank you so much, Linda. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. And I'm going to read from my forthcoming memoir, The Angle Flickering Light. It will be released April 6th, um, but it is available for pre-order now. Um, so I'm just going to read from the beginning. And the first chapter is called Left Behind. At five years old, I sat Indian style on the foot of my father's bed alone in his new condo. I'd gathered his ballpoint pens from the desk in the corner and began assessing the pictures of women adorning the pens. They wore spiked high heels and bright colored leotards and bikinis and blue sequined triangular tops that reminded me of my older sister's dance recital costumes. Their miniature figures pronounced behind sparkles and strings, their bodies splayed into decorative shapes. I tipped them upside down and their sparse garments fell off. They were proportioned women with hardened pink nipples and clumps of dark hair between their legs. 
I clothed and unclothed them with the flick of my wrist, turned them upside down, them right side up again. They were grown up like my mother, whom my father had just left. I was mesmerized by these ladies, by their full buoyant breasts, by the inner curves of thighs that made a hollowed out space for their private parts to breathe. I lay down, watching their clothes fall piece by piece, nestling myself into the cushion of the king-sized bed. The ladies made me think not only of my mother, but also of the faceless women my father rambled on about while out to eat at our favorite Italian restaurant. My sisters and I sat silent, letting him reiterate that Brenda, his secretary, who'd quickly become his girlfriend, had nothing to do with my parents' impending divorce, that he'd been cheating on my mother for years with all kinds of women, including prostitutes. Your mother just didn't want to admit it. She kept her head in the sand. Remember her friend Marla? Marla had lived with us for a while when she needed a place to stay in between moves. I slept with her too. We had an affair for two years while your mother and I were together. Ask her. When we arrived home from dinner crying, we gathered in my oldest sister's room. My mother came in to find us sitting on the bed. What happened, she asked. Krista was 12, so she did most of the talking. He said he's been cheating on you for years, that you knew, that every time he went on a business trip, it was never for business. While my mother listened, I kneeled behind Krista and began to pop the cysts on her back. I worked around the straps of her tank top, performing a job I always volunteered for since she couldn't reach. My sisters talked fast repeated my father's words, the gestures he'd made, how he acted as if we must have known about his mistresses all along. I concentrated on squeezing, on trying to find the pointed heads on the bumps of her skin. Harder, she usually said, until all the pus comes out, until they start bleeding. But today, she didn't tell me what to do, just waited for my mother's response. I can't believe he told you those things, my mother said. She looked at the orange walls, the baskets of necklaces made of white seashells and gold nuggets, stacks of teen magazine and Prince's first albums on cassette tapes. She stood there with a blank look in her eyes, the face of someone who no longer recognized her house or her daughter's bedroom. I waited for the yellowish cream, held a tissue to catch a glob when it emerged, then the speck of blood. I chimed in. He said he's been having affairs since the 70s. My mother seemed shocked and her lip quivered as if she didn't know what else to say. She made no indication that my father's statements weren't true. She only said, he never should have told you any of that. I liked that I was good at this job, maneuvering these small red mounds, judging when to squeeze harder and when to ease up. I had no worries about scars since no one would be able to see them and I felt a kind of satisfaction when the sticky fluid appeared, like the purging of something, but I didn't know what. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Gina. I wanna thank all of the authors for reading their work tonight. What an incredible treat to hear you. We're gonna end right at seven o'clock, but we have time I think for at least one question, and we've got a great question from Erica Girard, and it's pointed to all of the authors. The question is, what encourages you the most about what you have written and what you have yet to write? So if an author wants to unmute and answer, now's your chance. Um, I'll go ahead and go since we've got a few people, I guess, ready to go, so I'll be brief. Um, the, what encourages me most is when I get personal uh, notes from people who have um, read the book and they tell me that it uh, touched a very personal chord with them that uh, allowed them to overcome something that, they, that occurred when they were younger at that pretty tender age uh, that um, my main character is 15 and, um, and many unsettling things happened then. So it's just great when they, they you know, it, it's a wonderful thing about a small press in general that um, 
people feel, readers feel that they can um, contact you directly. Uh, you can't do that with best-selling authors. You'll never, you'll never make an impact. But that's the reason to, to write, to reach people. And so mm -hmm. that's my answer. Thank you. Well, I, also... I would just say that um, what, I, what encourages me is that when people see things in my microfiction stories that I didn't know was there or that I hadn't intended or that I hadn't seen. Because the thing about micro is that there's a lot of white space. There's a lot of room for the reader to enter and, um, and have their own experience and have their own interpretation. So that's always fun. And if, if, what they, if, if what they find is really great, I'll just take credit for it and say, yes, I knew it was there all along. Um, so yeah, that's, I, think, I think that's the most, uh, the most fun for me in writing microfiction and why I keep doing it. And I agree, the reason to write is to connect. So next. I think Joanne and Janet also have comments. Am I right, Joanne? Yeah, I, I think what keeps me going is also um, comments from other people and uh, especially surprising ones about that something I wrote resonated for someone else. Uh, so of course, that just that makes it fun to write. But also uh, what gets me started is when something, uh, a memory comes up for me or something is quirky for me. I was recently um, researching some of the odd things my elderly dog is doing and ran across a statement about um, dogs getting lost in corners. And I just couldn't get that off my mind. So I wrote a ode to my elderly dog that also had the line about getting lost in corners in it. So well, just fun that. things like that. <laughs> Thank you. Janet? I, th I think for me, for this, um, for this book, for Tom, um, what was, what's always been the, the nicest thing is to hear from either somebody who is Australian or has certainly traveled to Australia. And when they tell me that, um, that I got it right, I'm, I'm thrilled because um, I've never been. So um, it, it was, it, it's always great to know that that was always the best thing to hear about that book in particular. I see that Melanie, Gina, and Ian are all unmuted. So Ian, you want to go ahead? <laughs> uh, sure. Um, uh, so first of all, great question. And also I will definitely echo what everybody said about, um, about connecting with people and when you, when you share something or you make somebody laugh or you, you, you find something, uh, somebody really resonates with what you've written. Uh, but also say the more selfish reason that for me, writing is a fun activity. I have a good time with it. And, I like sort of the self-discovery process and thinking about things more and I'll make myself laugh, you know, when I'm, um, you know, when I'm working on something that's, that's, that's funny. Um, and so for me, like, it's a very enjoyable process. So the more I get involved with a story or with a project, the more I'll want to write for myself before I even show it to anybody. And so, um, so it's really those two components of the sort of self-rewarding aspect. And then when you actually get to share it with somebody and you get that second reinforcement as well. Thanks. Melody? Uh, I was going to say, as a teacher, as well as a writer, I get very excited to be able to communicate because uh, communicating in a book feels very one on one. And for a long time, I've been a tutor, but I also teach uh, great university classes and large groups of people. And oh. being able to communicate with people oh. is a really good feeling mm, directly. Thanks. Because, you know, as a writer, we spend a lot of time alone. <laughs> <laughs> which is wonderful, but it's really nice to be able to, you know, share those experiences. And if I can Jeez, say I lost the sound. Oh, check. If I can say something that will make another writer's journey easier or write a prompt that'll spark interest in them, that's very exciting. Thanks. Gina? Um, I definitely echo what everybody said about connecting with people and um, you never know what people come back with that resonated with them that may have not been your intent. And that's always really cool. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, probably my more, I don't know if it's the selfish I, I, reason, but the main yeah. reason for writing I is um, to, get it. to sure make not. sense of <laughs> Um, is to process and to make sense of, you know, particularly for memoir. Um, I also write fiction, but with memoir, I think a lot of the reason 
I've written nonfiction is to just make sense of things that have happened and of, you know, my different experiences and other people's experiences. And um, it's my way of processing and kind of discovering what I can from that, so. Thank you, Carolyn. I, I absolutely totally agree with everything everybody <laughs> said. I'm, I'm not sure there's a lot left to say. Um, those are all my reasons as well. The connection, the, the maybe having an impact, emotional, intellectual, whatever it is on, on somebody's life. Um, for me, I write because I can't not write. It's an obsession and that helps, you know. I, I'm one of those writers I've never had to worry about orchestrating a writing discipline. Um, it's, it's just kind of this obsession. So, and, and I feel very grateful to have that and never more so than the last year of pandemic <laughs> to uh, have something that doesn't require anything outside my own head, outside my own little writing room. It's, uh, it's very, very uh, sustaining. And Thank you, Karen. It's been good. Thank you everyone for taking a moment to answer that excellent question, Erica. Thank you. And it is just about time. Uh, I just want to um, say on behalf of myself and the authors and Vine Leaves Press, just feel really grateful that you could all join us. And I wanna thank Jessica Bell for designing the excellent graphic for this event and Kevin Barrett for providing technical assistance. And I wanna let you know that if you're interested in learning more about these authors and their work, please visit the Vine Leaves Press website at vineleavespress.com. That's vineleavespress.com. Thank you. We appreciate you and your love of reading. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> thank you so thank much, you. Linda. Thank you, everybody. Yes, thank, thank you, everybody, for coming. Thanks this was for fun. coming. Bye, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Take care.